Let's shift to our next topic area, which uh, we're calling vehicles, okay? Um, we're hearing the phrase bus rapid transit a lot more in this region. Um, we're hearing it both as, a, I think, a serious contender in the Southwest Corridor. Uh, we're hearing about it uh, potentially on Powell Division. Um, what do you see as the future of BRT as a tool for TriMet to use? And BRT comes in a lot of flavors from what people call enhanced bus to you right. know, a full dedicated right of way. Um, what's TriMet think about BRT and what, what flavors might we see in the future? Well, we, we have a number of corridors around the region that we think are excellent candidates for BRT. As you noted, it's a contender in the Barber Corridor. And I think as we think about it in a Barber Corridor, 99W, it, it probably has a lot of reserved lane, uh, maybe not entirely, but an awful lot of reserved lane to make sure that the transit vehicles can bypass congestion. Uh, so that might be the most, if you will, enhanced alternative that we'd look at uh, of the corridors we're looking at right now. Um, Powell Division is very different. You know, for example, you might know that we have a transit way planned as part of the Portland-Milwaukee project that from really running from um, uh, Powell and Milwaukee uh, along the light rail alignment onto the bridge straight downtown so that the number 17, the number 9, the number 19 can all take advantage of the free-flowing conditions on the bridge to serve South Waterfront as well as the south end of downtown really well, great efficiency. So there's already part of a busway, if you will, there. Now the rest of the corridor, I think, is going to be subject to variations in treatment. And that will be everything from um, signal bypass lanes, we see that right actually at that same intersection as of, of Powell and Milwaukee where you have right turn except bus and the buses could go through on the right turn. Um, to uh, curbside lanes, um, to special turn lanes at various places. And we haven't obviously designed that corridor or begun to think about what those corridors, but my sense is there'd be a, a big mix of, um, of tools that would be applied in that corridor, uh, reaching out to Gresham. Um, and what we also want to think about at the same time, and this would also apply to another corridor that we have in mind for bus rent, which is Tall Valley Highway, where there may be an overlap of service, where we have uh, an express service that doesn't stop every uh, three or four blocks, as well as a local service. And so then how do you accommodate that within the overall design of the transit improvements is also one of the challenges. I might note that pattern of express and local is mm -hmm. one that we think can do a lot of good for the region. And actually, one of our service improvements this September will be to enhance the 94 that provides service, express service from, from Sherwood to Tigard, uh, Barber Transit Center, um, and to Portland, and actually that will become all-day service. Hmm. Uh, not at great frequencies originally, hmm. but all-day service with actually very good frequencies in the AM and PM at peak hour. Uh, that will be supplemented then by the 12, which provides local service at the same time. We think that's a great pattern that we could see on the Twalton Valley Highway, for example, or in the Powell Division Corridor as well. So the, the canonical example for BRT is probably Curitiba, mm -hmm. where you've got dedicated busways, you have um, stations where you prepay and you load the bus very quickly. Uh, is anything like that in, in our region's future, or is it likely to be the more scaled down versions? Well, I think somewhat scaled down from that. Um, but you know, the, the Barber example I was beginning to talk about begins to approach that. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, for example, even on Barber, we think we need perhaps uh, separate lanes to avoid congestion from just generally Twilliger through the, um, the, the general Tigard area. Um, and that can take a whole number of forms that I, I, our, our uh, corridor designers are looking at right now. But, for example, what we call through the trees, the section really from um, uh, Twilliger through to Hamilton probably doesn't need any. It's a free flow area. It probably doesn't need any separate treatment. So there'll, there'll be a mix. Um, when you start thinking about Powell Division, I think it is also a mix, uh, just by the nature of the corridor and the, you know, frankly the the need. The the lanes that are there are generally abutted by businesses in many cases, mm -hmm. and so there's going to be some right away constraints we have to be very real about. Okay. Continue our vehicle discussion. Um, we hear lots and lots of complaints about the seating configuration of the Type 4 cars. Uh, we understand that there are some improvements to that in the Type 5s. Any consideration of 
backporting those improvements into the existing Type 4 cars? Um, not possible. Uh, just from a basic configuration standpoint, what is required, it's much more than just moving seats around. It's actually moving axles and gearboxes and other things associated with the equipment that, that, that runs that center section of the seat car, as we call it. So there's actually quite a bit of redesign in order to achieve large extent what we have um, been able to accomplish with our old Type 2 th and 3 light rail cars um, where we have the seats adjacent to the windows sort of facing each other in that center section. That's what we're aiming for and we'll have in our Type 5 light rail vehicles. Um, and by the way, while there's some complaints about the seating, what I would tell you about the Type 4 light rail vehicles is they've proven to be enormously um, resilient in terms of their reliability hmm. uh, and very, very strong performers in the fleet. So, you know, I always think about a, I'm a transit rider every day. My hierarchy is make it safe, make it reliable, uh, and then make it frequent uh, on top of that. And so the Type 4s have really helped with those, uh, particularly those last two. So given that some of our routes are experiencing overcrowding right now, you know, your service enhancement plan will, will help with some of that, but is there any consideration of purchasing some form of higher capacity buses? Well, we, we look at that, and as I've, I've explained to May, we actually look at that almost every year and look, begin to look at the, the trade-off. But there are a lot of trade-offs. Um, there are, you know, effects downtown on the mall. There are effects along the alignment um, where, for example, a 60-foot articulated bus might be a little, little harder to, mm -hmm. to fit and manage. Um, and the problem, of course, is oftentimes those... Um, crowded periods are for short periods in the in the a.m. and p.m. peak. Uh -huh. But we put our buses out. When they go out on the street, they're out there all day. Uh -huh. uh, and we do, you know, a number of seat slides, as our frequent riders know, where uh, an operator, we you know, uh, actually um, changes seats with another operator along the way. So um, the, you, you'd have the advantage during a short period of peak, but you'd have some disadvantage during the rest of the day. So that's what we're looking at. Now, for some of the BRT lines, as we were just talking, I think they make an enormous amount of sense, particularly for those more express style lines. So I think they're definitely on the plate. We definitely look at it. We definitely think um, there's no issue about reliability. Like, we, I, I would, met, would tell you that it, uh, <laughs> memories of TriMet are very long, and people will tell you about the Crown Icarus uh, buses. But we know that right now that there are some very reliable, high quality, um, um, you know, longer buses that actually are, are a good thing, uh, that are good for the industry, but not quite fitting us right now. So some of our readers have suggested that if vehicle length is an issue, we could look at double-deckers. Has that been examined? We've looked at it. Now, double-deckers will work fine for long um, routes, uh, for long express routes, but there's obviously a difficulty uh, of getting people on and off. It's not good for the kind of uh, routes that have a lot of on and off activity um, because of the separation of floor, the need to climb a stair, and all that sort of thing. So, um, again, if you begin to look at our network, we don't have a lot of what I'd call express service. We have just a few of those lines, uh, and to a large extent, it doesn't make sense then for us to get a separate fleet going hmm. for those relatively few lines in terms of the maintenance and spare parts and all that sort of thing that go along with it. Yeah, I think some of the people who've called for those are on the number 12 line. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then are the prospects for more hybrid or alternative fuel buses? Are we going to get ourselves off diesel one of these days? Um, you know, I'm really looking hard at that. So, as you, you know, we, we actually put in place four, or put in the fleet four um, hybrid buses and actually performing pretty well. I, I could watch the fuel economy pretty dramatically. They're actually up about 20%, which is way different than our first generation hybrids, which had almost zero effect on, on fuel economy. So, uh, definitely the technology is improving, and I think that's something to continue to watch. In 2015, we've got another four with the next generation of hybrid technology coming. So we'll be in a position where we can begin to evaluate that. Um, but you know, you bring up a really important point, which is uh, one of the things I'm very proud about TriMet as is it's a very innovative agency, whether it be our smartphone, mobile ticketing app that's coming, 
our advancement of electronic fares, um, the sort of first in the nation to put all of our real-time arrival data out on the out on the uh, web so that application developers can have have their go with it. And we've out of that we've got great things like the PDX bus app and, and some others. Um, but one of the other areas that I really do want us to in innovate in is uh, is bus technology, and so hence the uh, hybrid technology. The other thing we're starting to look at very seriously is CNG. Hmm. Um, and we are working with uh, Northwest Natural Gas, a great partner in the region, uh, I think a very good civic citizen, corporate citizen, uh, and they're beginning to look at ways for us to um, really begin to utilize their facilities. One of the things we don't want to be, we don't want to get in the natural gas business, you know, the uh -huh. transportation business is hard enough. So how can they help us um, transition? And we're, we're at very interested in seeing if it's feasible to transition one of our bus spaces uh -huh. uh, to natural gas within the foreseeable future. So those are technical studies going on. We have issues uh, to make sure that we chase down related to the reliability of those vehicles. But um, again, um, memories are very long at TriMet, and they might remember the first uh -huh. uh, series of natural gas, or and I think in that case they were liquefied natural gas buses, and they, they were not reliable. Uh -huh. But we now know that most of California has CNG buses. Uh -huh. uh, Pierce County in Washington has CNG buses, um, and the reports of reliability are really good. Uh -huh. Uh, so that's something we really want to continue to sort of dig into. So CNG is still carbon. Right? Yes. Uh, any consideration of electrification so we could go to renewable fuel sources? Well, it certainly our light rail does that. Mm -hmm. Certainly the streetcar does that. Um, there are, and I've been very intrigued with this, uh, a growing number of electrical bus mm -hmm. um, prototypes on the market, but they're very expensive. So and those are battery powered as opposed to the trolley bus design with the catenary. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And I think that's actually where things are going. As battery technology continues to improve, there is an ability, uh, I think, to store enough energy for a typical bus line where, you know, a very fast charge at the end of an alignment during a layover uh, may be enough to power the system. And that's the Protero system, just to name the manufacturer. If anybody's interested, they've got a very interesting website with. Uh, a lot of information about that bus. But the buses are pretty expensive. They're like generally twice what a uh, diesel bus or more, mm -hmm. plus each of the charging stations, which you know perhaps one at either end of the line or uh, last I heard about a million dollars each. So there's, a, there's quite, a, quite a premium right now um, in doing that. And my priority is service. Um, and while technology is a great thing and we want to be innovative, the priority is getting service. And if you know, if the technology gets in the way of providing service, then service, in my view, has to win because the fundamental um, goal that we have is getting more people uh, on public transit uh, for all the benefits that it has related to both land use and transportation, emission reductions, all, as you well know, many reasons uh, to, to do that.